But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Our second reading comes from James, chapter 5, verses 7 to 12. Be Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth. Be patient about it until it it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish in your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may, may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we do again thank you for your word to us. Lord, we thank you that it is here to strengthen us, to encourage us, uh, to challenge us, that we might be formed more and more into the likeness of your dear Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. So Lord, give us hearts open to hear you this morning, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, some of you will have uh, used Every Day with Jesus over the years for your daily devotions, and dear old Sir Wynne Hughes always used to say that when you see the word therefore, you should ask yourself what it is there for. And this passage began, I'm not sure if it did in Ruth's translation, but it begins with therefore. And that actually links you with what has gone before, quite obviously. And what has gone before has been uh, two warnings. Firstly, at the end of chapter 4, there was a warning against traders who were overconfident about the future and of their own plans, and that they would make money and do well and be successful. And then there was the first six verses of chapter 5, in which James speaks of rich people, rich people who oppress their employees, make money out of them, and rip them off. One hopes that James is not talking about members of the churches to whom he is writing, but the rich who oppress them, whom he has referred to in chapter 2, when he talked about not flattering the rich when they come to church or favouring them. He says, after all, aren't they the very people who oppress you? So we assume that they aren't the rich people uh, in the church that he's talking about in chapter 5, those who oppress their workers but they are the outside people who don't know the Lord who are treating them badly. And so what we hear now is in the light of that context. It's a given that the Christian brothers and sisters in the diaspora churches that he's writing to, they're Jews, uh, but they're believers in Christ as the Messiah. They are being oppressed. And the question is, how should they respond And I'm going to give you a summary of the sermon right now. Uh, You can then go to sleep if you like. But just, I think it'll make it easier for you to follow. And sorry, I haven't got this on the slide. But essentially, what James says is be patient and be steadfast. 
He says, follow the example, firstly, of the farmer, and secondly, of the prophets and Job. And the motivation for all this is, is that the Lord is very near. His coming will be soon, and he will put things to rights. So is that fairly simple? Be patient amid suffering. Hang in there. Wait for the Lord to come. Be inspired by the example of the farmer or the prophets and Job, if you like. Well, let's go through it now in a little bit more detail. Verse 7, be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. What sort of patience is he talking about? He's talking about patience that does not lead to retaliation. It's so easy, isn't it, when someone's oppressing you to try and fight them, to resist with the sword, if you like, or the equivalent of that, to rise up and rebel. That's a perfectly natural human thing to do. We're seeing it around the world at the moment, particularly with the Black Lives Matter movement. But the sword or the gun is never the way for Christians. Now, don't hear me wrongly. This sort of patience doesn't say you don't speak up, that you don't cry out, especially to the Lord. In fact, we heard that in chapter and the verses just before. In verse 4, we are told, The wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So there is an expectation that you will cry out, that justice will be called for. But what we don't do is take up arms and try and bring justice by our own power. That is never the way for Christians. So there is a sense of passivity. We accept the situation, but not in the sense that we don't preach out and speak out against injustice and unrighteousness. We are certainly meant to do that and seek peaceful change. So be patient, James says. And if it's not for someone else, but it's against injustice against yourself, sometimes you just have to suck that up as a Christian. It's more glorifying to God, and God will use that to refine you. That's how James opened his epistle, didn't he? My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. I don't believe we ever should fight for ourselves. Yes, we're going to defend our families. We're going to work for justice in the community. But our own suffering, we have to bear. We have to accept. And we don't resist. Why? Because we look to the Lord to bring justice. It's he who will sort things out. The analogy of the farmer that he uses in verse 7, the farmer waits for the precious crop from the earth, being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also must be patient. That is an image straight from Deuteronomy, from chapter 11 and verses 13 to 15, where Moses says this, If you will only heed his every commandment that I am commanding you today, loving the Lord your God and serving him with all your heart and with all your soul, then he will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain, and you will gather in your grain your wine and your oil, and he will give grass in your fields for your livestock, and you will eat your fill. James is picking up on that command and again saying, obey the Lord, wait patiently, just as the farmer does, and the Lord will give you justice in his timing. We can trust him for that. We're told uh, by Paul in Romans 12 
Vengeance is the Lord's. We're told, Paul too says, don't try and fight and gain vengeance yourself. You need to wait and trust the Lord will do this. And he will. We have already been told that he hears the cries of the harvesters. And then James said to the rich, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. That's a strong statement, isn't it? You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. God sees and God knows. Isn't that what he said at the beginning of Exodus? We read that the cries of the, Egypt, of the Hebrews went up. And I think it's chapter 1 or chapter 2 closes. And the Lord heard. He noted. And when he does that, we know that in his timing, he will act. There will be judgment when the Lord returns. There will be wrath against that sort of evil and oppression. If there isn't, there's no justice, is there? But it's in the Lord's hands, not ours. So we are urged to be patient and wait for the Lord to sort things out. But there's something else that James says we can do. In verse 8, he says, As well as being patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. What does it mean to strengthen our hearts? It actually means literally to steal your heart, to harden it, not in, a, not in the wrong way. We talk about hardness of heart. It's not that sort of hardness, but it's a hardness that will not be moved. It's the same word that Luke uses in Luke 9.51. We remember that's the turning point in Luke's gospel. Luke 9.51, you need that verse written in your heart. We're told Jesus set his face for Jerusalem. That setting the face is the same word as the strengthening of the heart here. Jesus, knowing that the cross was before him, had to steal his resolve. He was determined that he would not be moved from the course on which he was called to, run, to walk. And that's what James is saying for us. When we are being oppressed, when people are treating us wrongly, we trust him, but we steal our hearts and we say, this is not going to beat me. My trust is going to remain in God. I know he's heard my cry and he will strengthen my heart. Paul prays that in 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 3. He prays for them. He says, May he, may the Lord so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Again, Paul has Christ's return in view. God will hold us till then if we continue to trust in him. But there's a real danger lurking here, and James is straight on to it. He says, Beloved, do not grumble against one another, so that you may not be judged. James is aware of something that I think we're all aware of. That often when you feel powerless to resist an outside force or an outside oppression, what do you do? You actually turn against the very people who you're closest to. Does that make sense? Often a community, when it gets frustrated about not being able to change its circumstance, then starts getting niggly with one another. And the fellowship begins to break up. And it can happen at the personal level as well. One of the problems for me is that I'm meant to be nice all the time. <laughs> if I publicly get angry or do anything, then everyone says, oh, he's a pastor. He shouldn't behave like that. And they're right. So what does the pastor do? He's lovely to everybody else. He gets home, throws his keys down, and starts launching in about all these people who are causing him trouble and grief. None of you, of course, these are people outside the church. <laughs> it's a real danger, isn't it? 
that when we face troubles, we, we're strong in terms of in the face of those, but then we have an outlet elsewhere, and often it's in the fellowship. I use a book as part of my daily devotions. By uh, it's, goes, it's actually written in the 19th century, which uh, probably explains a lot for some of you. Um, <laughs> It's by a Scottish theologian called John Bailey. It's called A Diary of, Pri of Daily Private Prayer. It's not meant for public reading. It says that. But I'm going to read you a bit of day 21. This is the prayer. O spirit unseen, be with me today wherever I go, but also stay with me when I am at home and among my family. Do not let me fail to show those nearest me the sympathy and consideration that you graciously help me to show other people. Do not let me refuse to show those closest to me the courtesy and kindness which I would show to strangers. Let charity begin at home today. Whenever I pray that, and it's once a month, it always hits me. How good is my conduct at home? It's all very good to be a professional Christian, but what's it like when your guard's down? And it's the same in the church. Uh, Shirley Anderson had a, uh, a dream. It was a dream, wasn't it, Shirley? Just before, or just as we were leaving uh, St. David's. And that dream was of a picture. She was on a bridge, going across a bridge with the congregation. It was a, a, a strong impression for her of the congregation of God speaking and saying, we're going over this dangerous uh, bridge and we all start fine, but as we get along the way, some people get distracted. Some people are fishing there, you can see. Uh, but it gets particularly dangerous near the middle where the sides are lower. And, and of course, it's higher and the bridge is narrow and people are actually jumping off. Not everyone will complete the journey. Am I being faithful to it, Shirley? She says, I am. And you had a strong sense that that was a prophetic dream that you had. And so you painted it. Uh, being a painter, you could do that. We need to listen to these words. This is very much, I think, in keeping with what James is saying here. We are a danger that we'll end up grumbling against one another, not because of any problems maybe we've got with one another, just our frustration gets taken out in the wrong way. We have to guard against this, says James. And then he says, look for inspiration. Look at the example of the prophets. Look at the example of Job. He says the prophets, they suffered incredible injustice really. They were God's mouthpieces. And yet their own people turned against them, even their own family. Remember Jeremiah, whom we looked at in detail last year? What was Jeremiah's problem? His own family. He was from a family of priests from Anathoth. I'm so good that, glad that these sermon series make such a deep impact, all right? It's not even a year ago. And you, well, it was about a year ago. And you've forgotten dear old Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Remember and his first lament? Lord, this is too hard, this job you've called me to. And God, with his pastoral heart, says, Jeremiah, if you can't run against men, how are you going to go against horses? If you can't make it down on the, on the plains, how are you going to make it in the thickets in the hill country? You know, in other words, harden up, man. Get going. The job's not finished. Look at poor old Ezekiel. He got a hard time too. And things weren't good in his family either. His wife was dying. And we're told, uh, God tells him, uh, Ezekiel in chapter, I'll have it for you in a second. In chapter 24 and verse 15, if you've got, him there, got it there, God says to him that uh, he isn't going to be allowed to mourn or grieve. Uh, he has a job to do. And then in verse 15, we read, Ezekiel said, So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And on the next morning I did as I was commanded and got up and preached again. That's a bit of a hard call, isn't it? Reminds me of an Auckland Anglican minister called Mark Beale. Some of you may have heard of Mark Beale. He uh, was the minister of a church in Clendon in South Auckland. 
a very low decile area, three prisons in it, including the women's prison. Mark did an incredible uh, ministry there. But one Christmas Eve, his son died. Mark got up the next morning, he took the Christmas services. And then he shared with his congregation that his son had died the night before. I mean, his son was expected to die, but man, I couldn't have done that. Sometimes you just have to get on, steal your heart, and get up and preach. And these people should inspire us. They do me. Hosea was another one. What was Hosea's particular gift? His wife. wife. And what was she? A prostitute. prostitute. Why did he have to marry her? Because God said, you need to marry the sort of person I've married. I've married Israel. Israel acts like a whore. You marry a whore. And then you'll know how to speak my word. Don't ever want to be a prophet. Well, I shouldn't say that. Do want to be a prophet, but be aware of what it can mean. It's not a soft job. John Wesley, he got married. Why? Because he felt God said he had to. He married a woman called Mary. It was a miserable marriage. It was on and off for about 20 years, and then finally she left him once and for all. A great hero, a great hero of mine. A man of God, but he carried his own cross. Hard to understand. But James says, these people show us that patience, endurance, is what wins for God in the end. And then, just for good measure, he throws Job in. Well, we all know about Job. And James says, you have heard of the endurance of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord. Well, who thinks Job was patient? He was nothing but impatient. He was constantly railing against God, groaning and saying, come on, Lord, you've got to explain what's going on. This is so unfair and I don't understand it. But Job never stopped trusting God. The very reason he appealed to God was he knew that God did have the answers, that God is real. And whereas his friend said, just curse God, he said, no, I cannot do that. I know that my Redeemer liveth and he will appear. And one day I will understand. And of course, at the end of Job, if you go to the uh, end of chapter 42 of the book of Job, you find uh, this little uh, ending. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He'd paid a fairly high price. But God did reward him for his faithfulness. But that isn't what James meant, I don't believe, by saying God worked out his purpose through Job. That's revealed a few verses earlier in Job's last speech. The end of Job's last speech, his final words are, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. That was God's purpose in all Job's suffering, was that Job might know him fully. How was he going to know him fully? Through suffering, through testing. What does uh, Jesus say in John 17 about eternal life? He says, eternal life is this, that you may know me and the Father who sent me. That's the purpose of this whole life, is that we might know God. Yes, there may be material blessings along their way, along the way, but that's pretty irrelevant because they're going to be gone anyway. You can't take them with you. The point is that we are being refined, as James says at the beginning there, those early verses I read. We are being formed 
refined, tested. And when Christ returns, if we have stayed faithful, then he will pour out his compassion and his mercy upon us, says James. And we see it elsewhere too. What James is saying is this is worth waiting for. It's worth being patient. It's worth turning the other cheek. It's worth enduring testing and injustice because we know that one day Christ is going to come and there will be a judgment. Those who have fattened their hearts rather than fixing their hearts on the Lord will be subject to God's wrath and we can't avoid that. That's the truth. Otherwise, there's no justice, is there? Those who have oppressed, those who have lived well in this life, have turned against God, will be held to account. If you read the parables that Jesus tells that relate to his coming, his return, the first thing that always happens is that the true believer is revealed and the fake is exposed. The one who goes and hides their talent in the ground, for example, they are exposed. It will be seen who are the true believers. And those who have been fake or who have tried to deceive God will be punished. Those who have remained true will be rewarded. Our, our deeds will be weighed. It's not our salvations at stake at this point. We'll all be saved. But God will reward us according to how we've lived. And if we have lived for ourselves then our reward obviously will be less. Now, we've no idea what this means in terms of what the reward is. But clearly, what we do here matters. And when Christ comes, there will be a sorting out. But the main point James is saying is hang in there, endure. I wonder if any of you are familiar with the English rabbi Jonathan Sachs. He's quite a prolific writer and speaker and well worth reading. He, was, uh, he wrote this, uh, talking about a meeting that he was at where he'd spoken about the struggle that Jews have. He says, once after having spoken about some of these ideas, someone came up to me and said, I appreciated your words, but don't you think you are fighting a losing battle? It was a good question. What I replied, though, was this. Yes, the Jewish fight is a losing battle. It always was. Moses lost. Joshua lost. Jeremiah lost. We have striven for ideals just beyond our reach. Hoped for a gracious society just beyond the possible. Believed in a messianic age just over the furthest horizon. Wrestled with the angel and emerged limping. And in the meanwhile... Those who have won have disappeared, and we are still here, still young, still full of vigor, still fighting the losing battle, never accepting defeat, refusing to resign ourselves to cynicism, or to give up hope of peace with those who, today as in the past, seek our destruction. That kind of losing battle is worth fighting more so than any easy victory, any premature consolation. If a man who doesn't believe in Jesus can write that, and of course his hope is in God, nevertheless, then how much more should we be able to see the wisdom of what James says? It may seem that we are losing the battle, but God is surely going to put things right in the end. When Christ returns, the world will be renewed. And those who are the children of God, the true children of God, will be revealed. And God's mercy and compassion will be poured out upon us. What do we do with verse 12, though? Where James says, But above all, my beloved, do not swear. Is that more important than everything else that James has talked about? I go with the commentators who say that they don't believe that James is saying taking an oath is more important than enduring to the end. 
It's more a case of James is winding up his letter and he's got some things he still has to say. And so what he's effectively saying is, and before I finish, listen to this. This too is important. He again returns to the tongue, doesn't he? It's a theme that's come out a number of times in James. And I like the idea of one commentator that what he has in mind here particularly may be Peter. Remember James is Jesus' brother? He would know Peter well. What did Peter do when he got in a tight spot, when his faith was really tested? He swore an oath, didn't he? I swear I do not know the man. An oath he bitterly rejected, of course. A wrong oath. But no oath, says James, is necessary anyway. If you believe in God, you believe. You don't have to swear an oath to prove it. Uh, One commentator said quite a, a witty thing. The tight corner and the loose tongue easily go together. It's true. So we need to be careful how we respond. The call is to endure patiently. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for this uh, epistle of James. We thank you that James came to faith in his brother Jesus, presumably after the uh, resurrection. Lord, we thank you for the faith that you've given each of us. We pray that we might be faithful and testing. Lord, guard us from retaliation or impatience. Guard us from grumbling, especially against one another. Guard our fellowship. Guard our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.